All right, hello everyone. How's it going? Matt here with special guest F. Scott Feel. Um, if you could quickly introduce yourself for everyone who's watching who does not know you, who you are um, just with your career and everything. Sure. Um, name is F. Scott Feel. I've been a physical therapist now about 10 years. Um, I went to Wake Forest University for my undergrad, was an English major, um, and then transitioned into the world of physical therapy. Uh, did my master's at East Carolina University, uh, then went on to do my transitional doctorate through University of St. Augustine, uh, where I continued on to do the educational doctorate there as well. Uh, and I am just finishing up my dissertation now. Uh, should be done by the end of the year, I hope. Yes, that's that's true. And also, um, what about your podcast that you got going on? <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, Brandon Pone actually reached out to me um, and was interested in doing a podcast on education, which uh, it was a perfect fit for me at the time because uh, for the last three years doing this educational doctorate, I've really been struggling to figure out what direction I want to head with it. And, um, you know, it, it's been a, a, a blessing in disguise because I, I've been able to learn so much from our guests on the podcast that really, uh, you know, it's it's been helpful to me. I'm really starting to finally navigate my journey and see which direction I want to head with the educational doctorate. It's, uh, it's called the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Um, and you can look us up online and we're on iTunes as well. Yeah, so... The big question, uh, the main reason I, I sort of brought you up on here, Eska, is uh, like this this career with physical therapy and just the profession as a whole, and and how things have changed, and how especially with your own story, people seem to be getting burnt out, and just um, what's what's your your sort of take on that with your yourself personally, and then just your view. Yeah. So when I was in undergrad um, and then eventually grad school, I kind of thought burnout was was BS. I didn't think it really existed. I was like, there's no way. Like if you're in a job that you love, like it, it should be, you know, peaches and cream. It should be fine. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I kind of I, I, I experienced my first burnout before I was even a physical therapist, to be honest with you. I, uh, right. I had finished uh, grad school uh, at ECU. I was finished my master's. Uh, they offered the transitional doctorate to us uh, for one year only, and um, that didn't uh, that didn't exactly pan out the way I planned it. Because while I was um, in my master's program at ECU, or after I had just finished, uh, my dad had gotten sick, and um, he ended up having some heart problems and passed away during surgery. Yeah. Um, so you know, I kind of got stuck in that area of limbo there. And I ended up not being able to finish my DPT in time at ECU. So, um, you know, I had about a year there where it was kind of, I didn't know what I was doing with my life. You know, I was working as a PT tech, even though I had a master's in physical therapy, but hadn't yet passed my board exam. Um, it was, it was pretty brutal. And that's, you know, I literally got burnt out on physical therapy before I was even a physical therapist. Right. Uh, so you know, it, it, it was pretty tough. And that's when I realized, oh, wow, okay, burnout is a real thing. Um, <laughs> and it was good, though, because from that point on, I kind of found some good techniques and some good ways to kind of get around uh, burnout and to kind of uh, avoid it in, in the professional setting. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I know about yourself that uh, people might not know is that, like, um, your major, like what, what you were working on before physical, before the thought of physical therapy entered your mind and just how, um, how things like really changed for you. Uh, just, just what, what was your sort of like drive to all of a sudden pursue physical therapy? And then what are the things that change along the way? Yeah. So, uh, being an English major, uh, at Wake Forest there, like you know, I was always good at English because my dad was an English teacher in, in high school. And, uh, you know, he brought me and my brother up, um, you know, reading and writing at an early age. And my mom was an English major as well. Uh, she ended up going on into banking. But, um, you know, English was always a big thing in, in our household. Like we were always reading, always writing. So, uh, you know, my senior year in high school, I was able to place out of two AP Englishes, which I then transferred over to, to college. So I had two English classes already under my belt. 
So I figured, well, you know, I might as well use that toward a major and get that done early, you know? Right. So come senior year, uh, I have nothing on my hands but time. I think I took uh, golf, bowling, and intro to Japan my second semester senior year. So I had three days of nothing but, you know, working part-time and, and ha- having a good time. But, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. So I was, I was scared, man, because I didn't want to read. I didn't want to write. I didn't want to edit. I didn't want to teach. Mm-hmm. So what what am I going to do with an English degree, you know? So yeah. I started freaking out a little. So I thought, all right, maybe I'll go to med school, you know? Uh, took a practice MCAT, did fairly well, except for anything relating to organic chemistry. That just, I'd bomb that. And I think that's the thing that really weeds people out when they're going for, you know, MCATs and, and pre-med. And so... I was like, well, this isn't going to fly. I got to find something to do. Like, I, I know I can help people in the medical field some way, shape, or form. I just got to find my avenue. Uh, mm-hmm. So I volunteered at the hospital on one of my days off um, in Winston-Salem there. And uh, they put me in the PT department, filing folders and putting exercise charts away and things like that. And uh, I loved it. I was like, wow, this is great. I think I can do this. And then I looked at the list of prerequisites and I thought, nope, don't have that. Nope, don't have that. <laughs> nope, don't have that. And it, I mean... It was pretty rough. So I, I ended up graduating, um, you know, in four years with a BA in English, but then I had to take a whole nother year of, of prerequisites just to get into PT school. So yeah, I knew I that wanted is- to help people. I just didn't know how, you know, I, I didn't know my avenue until I realized I could do it through PT. Yeah, that that is really cool that you had that, uh, that insight. And it is definitely a commitment. But like, um, for yourself with the education side, the academic side, how how have your views um, sort of been shaped? Things that even me as a DPT student, I wouldn't know. Even people in the field of physical therapy, just in general, wouldn't know with with the academia side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I said, the last three years or so, while I've been doing the educational doctorate, um, if I if I back up a little bit. Uh, after I finished the transitional doctorate through St. Augustine, I had uh, the head of the EDD program approach me and said, hey, you know, uh, some of the classes that you took overlap. So you would turn a four year program into a three year program if you're interested. So I said, sure, you know, that sounds like a, a possibility. Let me talk it over with the wife and see what, you know, what she thinks and if it might be a good plan for us. And I thought to myself, you know, if my back goes out, if my hands give out with all the manual therapy I do, my knees give out and I just can't do physical therapy anymore. At least I could fall back on teaching maybe, you know? Uh, right. So I said, yeah, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's pursue this educational doctorate. It's a terminal degree. I could always get tenured if I wanted to. And that's when the real uphill battle began for me um, with education. You know, I, the classes were great. I loved my educational classes. I love learning about learning. Uh, if that makes sense. I love, you know, teaching aspects and, and different ways that, that humans learn. But uh, you know, the politics and the red tape that's involved with academia really rubbed me the wrong way. Every, you know, not every, but a good amount of professors that I talked to and friends of mine who were professors or uh, old professors of mine, um, you know, re- had really uh, jaded views on on academia. And, you know, I, I find it hard to utilize my teaching skills in a, in a setting that may limit me or may kind of try to guide me in a way that I don't feel is, is necessarily to the best of my ability. You know, um, tenure track, for instance, is, is a really mm-hmm. tough one. I mean, you know, yeah, it would be great to be tenured and it's a lot of work, but at the same time, you know, I don't think that just getting credit for publishing articles is, is necessarily a, you know, the way to go. How, how about I get some credit for teaching students to the best of my ability? You know, that's what I'm there for, you know? Right. Uh, you know, I just think that a, a lot of things you hear a lot about publish or perish, you know, and it's a, um, it, it's an unfortunate truth, but, you know, uh, we've had a lot of guests on the podcast that have kind of enlightened us as to how, how that track really works and how, you know, it really is. You've got to jump through all the hoops. You've got to do all the studies. You've got to try to bring in money. Um, Rich Severin was on the other day. I think his podcast yep. released today. And he was saying that, you know, some some professors actually have to fund their own salary to some extent. Um, you know, they have to bring in a grant that's big enough to support their study. And then their salary, a, a portion of it sometimes comes out of that. And I didn't, I didn't know that. So, I mean, that made things just even worse for me. You know, that that's not a kind of pressure that I want. Like, oh, I got to find this big grant in order to continue working. And that's not all, all positions, obviously, in all universities. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, it is a possibility. So, um, 
you know, like I said, my, my views of education have been jaded and I'm not, I'm not blaming the, the doctorate of, of PT. Like that's, I, it's a necessary evil and I think we need it. Um, and to all those that do teach in that profession, you know, and do teach in that setting, I, I am thankful for that because we do need competent, proficient entry level physical therapists. You know, we, we do, we we need them now. We're going to need them in the future. So the, there is a need for the doctorate of physical therapy. I just think that, you know, there might need to be some changes somewhere along the line, um, mm-hmm. you know, about uh, regarding the programs and the way they're run. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to throw this wild question out there. How, how exactly would you change the system if you could um, to be, you know, benefit students more or, or whatever view it is that you have? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's funny that you ask that because that's kind of like the question that we like to wrap up with on our, our podcast is if you could change one thing in education, you know, what would it be and how would you do it? And like I said, for me, I just feel like professors uh, don't get enough credit for doing a good job teaching. You know, I just feel like they, they literally, uh, I think you would have to change the tenure track weighting scale, you know? So if, if, uh, bringing in X amount of dollars and publishing X amount of studies over the course of your five or six year tenure track, whatever it may be, um, if that gets you so many points, like I think you should, you know, kind of get a good amount of points for just being a good teacher and having a good rapport with your students, you know? Um, I can't stand sitting there and listening to a lecture on PowerPoint. Like I just, I, I, I'm I'm not a a very good learner like that. I I, I like more interaction and I, I, I'm a very audible learner. I like hearing things. I I like listening to podcasts. I like, you know, um, taking in audio books and things like that. So for me, especially when I'm teaching, uh, I would much rather just sit in a classroom in a big circle um, and let's have a discussion. You know, I'll, you know, I, for a lot of the classes that I've taught, I kind of assign reading beforehand. It's expected that you come to class prepared mm-hmm. and then we just sit and have a discussion and let's try to learn that way. You know, I mean, there's going to be some guidance and some, you know, some t- topics we need to stick to, but for the most part, like, let's just see where the conversation takes us and let's see if we can get some of that higher level thinking, uh, and critical thinking uh, out there because that's to me, and and I learn from students all the time. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit I'm I'm probably not the smartest physical therapist out there. I'm probably not the smartest person in the room half the time. But you know, this is the the stuff I know, and here's what I can bring, and let's hear what you guys have to bring to the table too. You know, I'm I'm all good with that. Yeah. Like I'm totally good with with up teaching and up learning. You know. Yeah, and. So with your your views, your perspective, what's your take on like the current way things are being run with the profession for residencies, for fellowships, and for continuing education courses? That is a good question, my friend. I Looking back, right, my journey was a little bit skewed, right? It wasn't the normal straight, narrow DPT residency, you know, graduate. I wanted to do a residency. Um, I really did. It was on the top of my list. And I still might at some point in my life. I'm not opposed to it at this point. Um, But, you know, given all the factors and everything that happened uh, when my dad passed away and I finally did pass my board exam and ended up becoming licensed at that point, I kind of just needed some time to myself and and some time to travel. And, And I did. I traveled as a physical therapist for a year right out of school. Uh, I was in Livingston, Lake Livingston, Texas for about three months. I was in Honolulu, Hawaii for about five months and then uh, ended up in Asheville, North Carolina for about three or four months before I finally settled down. But, um, you know, I I wanted to take a residency. It just at that point in my life between the cost and, you know, just things I had going on on a personal level, I just wasn't ready to sit down and commit to that. Um, And, you know, it's one of the few regrets I think I have in my career um, you know, but I just think at the time the price was, was, was what was blowing my mind. It was like, man, I gotta, you know, pay eight, ten, eight to 10 grand to take this residency. Um, and I, I love the benefits that you get of getting five or six years of clinical experience all jammed into one year. Like, I think that's great. And that's why I really would, would have loved to do it. But at the same mm-hmm. time, I do think there are other options out there. Um, I do think there are alternatives, um, to residency. And I think, you know, practicing toward expertise is something that we really need to start looking at. Like, hey, you know what? If you don't do residency, that's fine. Although there was just apparently a, a, a kind of a board meeting recently that said that, you know, residencies might be going, you know, mandatory. Who knows? Uh, 
So that, that mm-hmm. could be an interesting shift in things too. But I think the bottom line is, you know, we have to stop going in and collecting a paycheck from nine to five and actually do more and be more and, and crave more, you know, and want to do better. And I think as long as we start gearing therapists towards that, um, and just, like I said, practicing toward expertise is, is what I kind of view it as. Um, I, you know, I think you'll be just fine. You know, you've got to seek out the CEUs that interest you and the CEUs that are in your niche. And then you just got to, you know, keep working at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it really does sound like most of the difficulties are just with like surviving, especially financially for a lot of different points, but for, Okay, this is a very different question for like the developing uh, sections, developing residencies, especially like uh, women's health, gender health. Like, I guess what advice would you give to some of the the shakers in, in those respective areas as far as um, sticking with it and not, yeah. not getting burnt out? Yeah, man. So, you know, the there's a lot of keys to kind of in clinic and in practice ways to avoid burnout. And I think one of the first ones uh, is, is kind of like you said, is that just sticking with it kind of thing you get in this one niche and you practice down to become this expert on this one thing and seeing the same thing over and over again can, can get boring. It can get redundant, you know, at times. And so that can cause a burnout. Um, But I think one of the biggest things to do is just, you know, really keep it different and keep it interesting in the clinic, you know, for both you and your patients, you know, here, three sets of 10 internal, external rotation with a red TheraBand, like that's going to get boring, man. You got to change it up. And we have access right now to infinite amounts of exercises, activities, you know, um, different uh, treatment approaches. There's so much out there on the internet. There's so many good classes out there and so many good people to learn from. I mean, you have no excuse to not change it up every day, you know, pick one thing you're going to focus on and just try that that day. The next day, pick a different thing you're going to focus on and try that, you know, keep it changing up for not only you, but for your patients too, because they'll appreciate that too. They don't want to come in here and do the same 10 exercises and then go home every day. They could go to a gym for that, you know? Um, so, you know, like I said, just changing it up, uh, And when it comes to experts, especially when you get down to that niche and you really start hammering it down, you know, you've got to learn to separate yourself from the outcomes. I think that's a huge one, too. You know, Uh, Uh, I I work in workman's comp, right? In occupational health right now. Right. So I I, it took me a long time. I'm going on three years now almost uh, in workman's comp, occupational health. And it took me a good almost a year to realize man, I am doing everything I can. And these people are not getting better. Like, what is wrong with me? I've been practicing, you know, eight, nine years. Am I, am, am I just not a good therapist? Like, what is going on? And it, it, I, I had to realize that, it, especially in occupational health and workman's comp, there is an aspect of malingering. And maybe people don't want to get better. You know, maybe they're not really trying to get better. They're not doing their all. They're not giving it everything. And, you know, I, I've done everything I can. I've done the best job possible, but they, you know, for whatever reason, secondary gain, you know, that's a big thing in workman's comp. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they all of a sudden say, well, my lawyer said, well, all right, that's great. But what med school did your lawyer go to? You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So um, I think that's important though, to separate yourself from your patient outcomes. As long as you do the best you can and you give it everything you've got to get them better and you know you tried everything you can, that's all you can do, man. That's what makes you a great therapist. You know, some scores on an outcome measure doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good or a bad therapist. Mm-hmm. Okay. For, uh, from most of my mentors, including you, a lot of people say that, uh, just being in school, we focus so much on, on skills, 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 skills. And like you said, like try to separate yourself from the patient outcomes because you're, you're still a person. So what, what are some of your key pieces of wisdom, advice for, for DPT students like myself or pre-PT students as far as just still continuing to grow and develop as a person and, and not solely the, the professional career aspect? Yeah. Um, well, so people in the physical therapy realm, for the most part, I think are, are mostly people, people, right? We're like, I'm a people person. I like to interact. I like to talk. I like to chat with people. I like to learn about them, you know? Um, 
there's ways that you can kind of enhance that a little bit. And I would say one of the best ways is to find a hobby, you know, outside of the world of physical therapy, find, find a, a hobby because the, the bottom line is it's, you know, you're going to go nine to five Monday through Friday for the next rest of your life. Right. That that's great. But if you're out there and you're doing something like golf, let's say, right. And you have a handful of buddies, four to eight buddies, and you go golfing every weekend or so. Right. Well, now you're at a, a new setting doing a new thing and you're learning how to interact with new people doing that different thing. Right. So I think it's important that, you know, you stay grounded in other things that are not just physical therapy. And I would start that as, you know, early as DPT student like that. You should be doing that now, like enjoy PT school and, and, and love it. But at the same time, do other things, man, get out there and enjoy yourself and, and interact with other people because you're just practicing, you're just practicing your craft, you know, and it's all about just learning how to communicate with people. Mm hmm. Yeah, a couple uh, comments from Paul Goff, the legend. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, and sharing with us. Yeah, definitely, definitely the listening aspect. And I, I know for myself as a DPT student, like we're we're just focusing so much on textbook and what's like objective and testable, I guess. But yeah. like, I don't know. On the on the flip side, like F Scott, we're going out there in the real world. Like, what are what are some the key pointers that you have. Yeah. So they call them soft skills, right? Which, you know, is, is your ability to, to interact with people and, and pick up on cues and, and uh, you know, really just be there and, and listen to people. Right. But those soft skills, uh, I mean, you know, nine out of 10 times, that's what ends up having somebody, you know, become a great therapist or not so great therapist. Right. Cause we all kind of graduate with the same skills. Um, you know, so it, it's it's the personality traits and the personality, you know, it, really it's empathy and, and compassion, right? It's being able to sit there and say, hey, listen, like, you know, I know what you feel. I've been through it. I, I, I feel you, you know, or the empathy where like, you know, I, I haven't experienced what you experienced, but I understand, you know. Um, I think if you can start doing that at a very, very early part in your career, you're going to succeed because, I mean, let's be honest, you've got, I don't know, uh, I'd say there's probably three or four different um, hard skills that you need to learn throughout PT school, which, you know, might be like evaluation, some manual stuff, right? Some documentation, and then like the, the intangibles. Um, everybody comes out with those same skills, though, at the end of the day, you know, so we're all competent enough. Once you pass the board exam, it's, you know, all, all systems go at that point. So you've got to find ways to like, you know, really become a better communicator, and I think, like I said, practice, 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 man. Get out there, like, you know, join a local theater company and, and do plays, yeah. right? Um, go golfing with the buddies, play poker with somebody, right? Go, uh, you know, volunteer. As, and I cannot stress that one enough. Volunteer and do things, like, for the community because the community is going to be around you for the next, you know, however many years you decide to live there. So get involved. And that those those interactions are what build context, right? Content is what we all put out all day, every day, right? Mm -hmm. Context is, like I said, kind of taking it up a notch and taking it up a level where if you interact with, with somebody, you know, Julie, the soccer mom with two kids, and she knows that you're a physical therapist, when her kid gets hurt, she's going to come to you because you had that really good conversation that time about safety on the soccer field, you know? That's context. That's the next level stuff that that's what's honestly going to make a difference. I mean, that's, that's what's going to really take you to the next level. Yeah, you you and Ben Fung really do hone that in for me about uh being being connected, and I I really do appreciate that. And so I, I'm gonna give you a chance to say anything that you really want to say about this topic or just in general. Yeah, just a couple of uh, quick pointers. Um, use your PTO and use it wisely, right? Yeah, take vacations, <laughs> oh, man. Yes. Take vacations because that's an easy way to avoid burnout. Like if you feel like it's coming on and you just feel like you're getting burnt, take a time out, man. Take a self 20 second time out because at the end of the day, 
vacations are going to be spent with friends or family or people you love. And again, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. That's who all this matters the most to, you know, I mean, that's the people who are there for you day in and day out. And and that's where the most fun is had, you know, uh, like I said, whether it be family or friends, um, you know, you, you get so many PTO days a year, vacation days a year, use them, use them all, plan them wisely, plan them well in advance and like keep a couple in the back pocket for just those days where you need a, a mental health day, you know, where you need a little like decompression day, like, man, this, this is getting pretty heavy. I need a little break. I need to let my mind unwind. Um, you know, I would definitely say that. Um, and, and really at the end of the day, you got to be flexible, you know, mm-hmm. you got to be adaptable, roll with the punches, man. I mean, life's going to throw you a bunch of curveballs throughout the way. Just, you know, roll with them because that's what physical therapy is all about, right? Oh, this, this treatment didn't work. Let's try it this way. Or, Oh man, he should be able to do that. He can't. Well, let's adapt it, right? Adaptability, man. Just being flexible. That's going to get you a long way in your career and that's going to avoid burnout real quick if you can roll with the punches. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is so true. So thank, thank you so much, F. Scott, for like yeah, staying man. up. You're, you're out there East Coast and really appreciate it. Everyone, you know, check out Healthcare ed, health care education and transformation podcast with f scott and brandon poen yeah really good duo there <laughs> yeah yeah how many, yeah how many episodes do you have out now i've, I've seen you've been like yeah so we, we release one episode a week um and essentially today was the 10th episode uh but two of our episodes were broken up into two parters so it's uh 10 episodes but uh 12 12 actual shows i believe were released so far um, but yeah, we plan on continuing to release one one a week for the next uh, several years, and hope that uh, we can get some good information out there about healthcare education. Uh, you yeah. know, we started the mission on you know a physical therapy kit because that's what we know best. But we're really starting to expand now and trying to go out to uh, nursing schools, doctor, you know, MD yeah. schools. Um, we're looking into nurse practitioner. We had a strength and conditioning coach on the other day. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it's it's really been a great ride. And, and, and really, everybody's got such good information. You can always pick up at least one or two golden nuggets from each episode. So definitely tune in. Um, you can head to pteducator.com. I, the link is right on there for the podcast. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Absolutely. Hope you, you, know, you got something out of this. So. All right. Have a good night.